this computer. <laughs> okay, so uh, he was born in 1819. He almost lived for the, the whole length of, of the 19th century. And um, he was born two years before uh, a great poet, uh, Paul. Uh, uh, to, uh, this, this year, there are 200 years since the birth of Charles Baudelaire. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll do the symposium, poetry and architecture, somehow uh, by the way of Baudelaire as well. Uh, although Baudelaire was uh, certainly a poet who advocated modernity, but I think he understood the duality of art quite well. He was also himself a great critic, uh, Baudelaire. So John Ruskin, born today, but in 1819, was the leading English art critic of the Victorian era, as well as an art patron, draftsman, draftsman, watercolorist, philosopher, proeminent social thinker, and philanthropist. He wrote on subjects as varied as geology, architecture, myth, ornithology, literature, education, botany, and political economy. I mean, I wonder about this little word and because it's it's possible we could have added a few more. Anyway, uh, his writing styles and literary forms were equally varied. He wrote essays and treatises, poetry and lectures, travel guides and manuals, letters, and even a fairy tale. He also made detailed sketches and paintings of rocks, plants, birds, landscapes, architectural structures, and ornaments. You know what I don't see here, with the exception of uh, the last two uh, architectural structures and ornaments, I don't see men. I don't see human beings. I see rocks, I see plants, I see birds, I see landscapes, and yes, in the end, uh, obliquely referring to the work of man. But I don't see men. And this says something to me. Uh, and. I want to tell you some uh, about a, a certain discovery I made um, some a good number of years ago. Uh, sometimes I mentioned this, so those who of you who heard me about this, I, I apologize. I don't like to repeat myself, but I think it's important to 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 uh, to mention this. When I was reading a, a poem that Goethe uh, wrote uh, called Prometheus, which he didn't finish. Uh, I discovered a strange name there, Epimetheus. And I didn't know who Epimetheus was. I knew of Prometheus, who stole the fire from the gods and gave it to, to the humans, but I didn't know anything about Epimetheus. So I did a little bit of so-called research and I found out that he was actually the brother of Prometheus. So the Greeks thought of two brothers, Prometheus, and in Greek, Prometheus means the one who first thinks and then he acts. And Epimetheus means exactly the opposite, the one who first acts and then he thinks. So we condemned Epimetheus to uh, being considered the responsible one, the one uh, who was unreliable, the one on whose shoulders we cannot climb because there is nothing to gain. But strangely, I think lately, Epimetheus became very, very relevant. And I will, I will, I will try to, to, to convey why. Prometheus loved the human beings, but he didn't care about rocks, plants, birds, and maybe even landscapes. And he didn't care about the gods either. But Epimetheus was quite the opposite. He, he revered the gods, and he uh, loved the plants, the animals, the rocks, but he didn't care too much about the human beings. Very, very interesting that the Greeks thought, created two brothers in their mythology, Prometheus and Epimetheus. Epimetheus in a way is like the, you know, the ecologist, the environmentalist, is, is the man of our time. We need badly Epimetheus. We had enough of Prometheus. Yes, Prometheus was also inspiring because a lot of what we call civilization and you know, uh, so-called development uh, were consequences of him giving us the fire. But 
but you know very well we are, where we arrived. You know, there is dirt at the bottom of the oceans, the levels of the sea is rising, uh, the, 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 the icebergs are melting, uh, the climate is changing. So it's not that we are visited by a scandalous uh, apocalyptic vision. The truth is, uh, is some very bad things happen because of the excessiveness of uh, humankind. So here we look at John Ruskin. Uh, you know, I mean, this little description about him as, you know, doing sketches and paintings of rocks, plants, birds, landscapes. Uh, uh, first, these are mentioned and with good reason, because, because I think there was perhaps a little bit of an Epimetheus in John Ruskin, perhaps. But again, I think it is important, by the way, not by the way really of John Ruskin, but I think it is important to reflect on the fact that the Greeks thought of two brothers, Prometheus and Epimetheus, uh, totally different. You know, Epimetheus, Epimetheus used to tell his brother, uh, Prometheus, please be careful. Don't make the gods angry. They will punish you. Well, that's exactly what happened. You know, uh, the liver of Prometheus is suffering to this day because uh, he didn't listen to his so-called irresponsible brother, meaning Epimetheus. But Epimetheus was totally forgotten because he was inconvenient. You know, he, uh, with, with his childlikeness, uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, relegated to, uh, you know, uh, the obscure zone of those, uh, you know, irresponsible, uh, the plain ones. And, and in time, it, it proved that the so-called uh, unreliable one uh, became, uh, I would say, very relevant. And I think he's relevant today. But let's, let's go on with, with, with John Ruskin. The elaborate style that characterized his earliest writing on art gave way in time to plainer language designed to communicate his ideas more effectively. In all of his writing, he emphasized the connections between nature, art, and society. Again and again, I mean again and again, again, nature comes first, then art as a bridge, and then society at, uh, at the end. He was hugely, hugely influential in the latter half of the 19th century and up to the First World War. After a period of relative decline, his reputation has steadily improved since the 1960s with the publication of numerous academic studies of his work. Today, his ideas and concerns are widely recognized as having anticipated interest in environmentalism, sustainability and craft. Uh, and now I'll show, um, you know, visual uh, material, uh, artworks by him, uh, watercolors, drawings, and so on. But first a few images of the man. Uh, here he is in, in this, uh, he was a gentleman, of course, but a gentleman who took his hat off in front of nature, as you can see. And by the way of this, I, I have the whole admiration for, uh, Frank Le, for uh, Le Corbusier, well, for Frank Lloyd Wright as well. But, but I have seen pictures with Le Corbusier with his hat on, surrounded by a lot of uh, monks when he was uh, designing uh, um, La Tourette uh, or uh, Ronchamp. He never took his hat off. And I also remember a picture with all the faculty of the Bauhaus on the roof at Dessau, where there was just one woman, uh, Günther Stelzel. She was teaching um, the textiles. The, all the others were men and brilliant men, Walter Gropius, uh, Marcel Breuer, uh, um, Laszlo Mokolinog, uh, uh, important, uh, Paul Klee, uh, Kandinsky, uh, you name them, who's who in, uh, in uh, modern art. And most of them who had hats, had their hats on their heads. The only one who took he, her head, her hat off was the woman, the lady. Now uh, you could say, uh, so what, what's so important? 
I think it is important. You know, why is it that of a group of uh, 15 brilliant people there, only the lady took her hat off and none of the men, and there were some very sensitive artists there. And also, why is it that Le Corbusier couldn't take his hat off even inside the church? Look at John Ruskin. He took, now you could say this, uh, you know, this portrait is an idealized portrait. And uh, no, I, I believe this man would take it. Now you could say I'm fantasizing and maybe I'm fantasizing. But from the little I read by him, I think this man would have taken his hat off near a falling water or near a river or near some rocks because he revered nature. And uh, I do believe that uh, perhaps uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was right when he said, when he was asked, he was about 85 years old in an interview uh, on TV uh, where the interviewer uh, asked him, do you believe in God? And Frank Lloyd Wright said, I do, but I spell it nature. And I believe Ruskin probably thought and felt in the same way. So in front of the majesty and, and the beauty of, of nature, how could you not take your hat off? Anyway, this was the man. Uh, and we need men like him. We need men like him in the world to, to you know, to be animated by, by, by other, other engines uh, besides uh, those that animate most of us, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, getting, um, you know, a so-called uh, earning a life by uh, earning a living by uh, making a profit and all those deals, you know, the art of the deal. What a horrid expression, you know, the art of the deal. What art is there? You know, what art is in building, uh, uh, you know, uh, amusement parks and, and casinos? You know, I know very well at what a casino is, and you probably already feel what I'm pointing towards here because you know who is building casinos. You know, I mean, in my, in my opinion, is is it, beyond understanding how a country should choose a president who who made made a so-called living. Uh, you know, earn a living by, by casinos, which are places of destitution and, and delusion. I, I, I know what they are. I have been in one of them. So, and I lost a little bit of money there. And so did Dostoevsky. Uh, you know, someone highly moral would not earn a living, so to speak, with casinos, not to speak about what uh, his grandparent uh, parent uh, earned a living with. I'm talking about the grandfather of the same man I was uh, referring to. Anyway, uh, look at him. You know, he had problems in the end. Uh, in the end of his life, I, I read that he, he, you know, he suffered some mental collapses. And of course, of course, because, you know, Nietzsche died, uh, uh, you know, uh, totally crippled mentally because of uh, uh, an incredible devotion to the to the world of ideas, to, and 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 yes, he lost it. And so did Hölderlin, you know, great minds who are, were not, uh, you know, merchants, you know, uh, selling their soul for a few bucks. Now these were great people, I think, and great in not in a demagogical sense, in a in a real sense. And it's sad, you know, that. Uh, uh, you know, they collapse sometimes because of the effort of the heart and of the mind. Um, so he, we read, he was a polymath. No, he, he did many things. He lived intensely. He fought lucidly, but also passionately for what he believed in. And I, I, I mean, you know, to have an art critic uh, develop such a, such a following and to, to, to I mean, this says something about the, the, the quality of, of Great Britain in the 19th century, where an art critic has had such a, um, you know, uh, importance within society. But he struggled too, you know, because this is the reality of, of life. Somehow, uh, exceptional human beings have to struggle, you know, and, uh, you know, they are sometimes misunderstood. Now, he was a man who was able to negotiate, I think, with society, but without betraying his own, uh, 
beliefs, his own faith. And uh, I don't know of too many art critics who our critics, he was not just an art critic, who also painted, who also uh, drew, who also, uh, you know, the watercolor, the lot, actually. So there was an artist in him too. And, 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 and the two very rarely uh, converge. I mentioned the Charles Baudelaire because he was also a great poet who was also very, very uh, uh, piercing with his uh, intuitions in the field of art criticism. For example, from, from uh, Charles Baudelaire, I learned a definition is not really a definition, an understanding of art that, that moved, him, moved me a lot and I agree with. He said, art has two halves. One half speaks about the, uh, the ephemeral, the circumstantial, uh, um, the temporary. And the other half speaks about the eternal and the immutable. So art has both halves. And I, I, I totally agree with you. It has to have a certain so-called modernity relating to what is temporary, uh, you know, fashionable, even uh, uh, cir circumstantial, transitory, uh, but also has to have a part which is uh, uh, independent, which is not affected by, uh, you know, uh, what what we call what is uh, circumstantial. So this poet, in a few words, I think, uh, defined art very, very well. John, John Ruskin, let's uh, look at, uh, for the last time now at the, at the picture of him. And, uh, and um, ah, by the way, he became uh, uh, known uh, from what I remember by publishing Modern Painters, was uh, like an art magazine. I don't know, I don't think it was published with many issues, maybe just one. But Modern Painters was uh, 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 republished uh, at the end of the 20th century uh, by a, a brilliant uh, art critic uh, in, in Great Britain, but coming from uh, Australia, I think, or New Zealand, Peter Fuller. Uh, and uh, I exchanged a few, uh, I forgot exactly how, uh, because there was no email then, uh, some, some uh, um, I had a, a short dialogue with him and, and he died tragically in a car accident at around 40. But what I want to say is the magazine that was uh, uh, founded by John Ruskin, Modern Painters, was republished uh, maybe more than 100 years later by Peter Fuller uh, in, uh, in, in Great Britain. And I, I know that he, uh, 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 well, there is so much to say and maybe I'm jumping from one thing to, to another. Peter Fuller was very much against uh, 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 the fascination with Francis Bacon, a very famous uh, uh, British uh, painter. Uh, but uh, he had uh, uh, different preferences and but this is uh, maybe another subject. Somehow, I mean, without doubt, he republished modern painters as an homage to John Ruskin. Um, okay. It is as if there, were, there are always two roads in front of us. There is a, the road we take or we took, and then there is the road we didn't take. And the road we didn't take and we don't take uh, per, perhaps needs a reevaluation from time to time. Like we took the road of living on the shoulders of Prometheus and we totally for, uh, forgot uh, uh, Epimetheus. Now, maybe it's time to re-evaluate the forgotten brother of, uh, of Prometheus. Some drawings by John Ruskin. He drew a lot. Uh, some, I had no time really to, to um, you know, I should have uh, renounced to the service of a few pictures, which are a little bit, uh, the resolution is not great, but I, I have also uh, more generous uh, pictures. It, it moves me the, the fact that John Ruskin, uh, uh, who had many preoccupations, also so-called found time to, to draw, as you can see with a, with a sharp pencil, 
even details of architectures that he loved. And uh, he, he did love architecture. For example, he said a great architect cannot be someone who is not also a great painter or a great sculptor. Because, because if someone was not a great painter and a great sculptor, uh, would never be an architect, would just be a builder. So differ he differentiated it, differentiated between a building, a mere building and an architecture. And uh, maybe it's not now the time to repeat what I already uh, said a few times about that quotation from Paul Valéry, who again, as a true poet had good intuitions and we better listen to the poets because the good poets know what they are talking about. I mean, even though, uh, um, you know, um, Plato thought that there are four kinds of madness, to be a prophet, to be a poet, to be in love, and to be a clinically mad person. And some people are mad at power four. They are prophets, they are in love, they are poets, and they also, unfortunately, so-called clinically mad. Uh, it's, it's about that kind of foolishness that, uh, that uh, you know, I mean, the frontier between the so-called fool and the, and the wise one is very thin sometimes. And uh, sometimes, not always, sometimes. Um, but anyway, uh, coming back to, to, to John Ruskin, uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, incredible uh, love affair with, 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 with architecture uh, is reflected in, in, in his writings and also in his drawings and his meditations on, on uh, what an architect is. He also advocated imperfection. He understood that imperfection could be a sign of vitality, and uh, in the so-called in, in the Gothic uh, uh, cathedral, uh, there were people who were not artists, who were not specialists, who were not experts. They had, of course, the master builders who even had esoteric knowledge. But from what I understood, the cathedral was built by a large number of people, and a, a, a certain number of them didn't have, uh, you know, they were not artists, yet they were allowed, they were even invited to, to express themselves into, you know, into uh, erecting the building. By the way of this, and I have somewhere here, but I'm a little bit afraid not to, to, to uh, agitate my laptop too much. I, I, am, I was very moved by the thoughts about the cathedral of a great artist of the 20th century. And that is the great Swedish filmmaker, Ingmar Bergman. Ingmar Bergman was asked, why do you make films? And he said, well, actually I didn't want to make films. He said, I wanted to participate to the building of the building of, of the big cathedral on the plane. But, but because that big cathedral on the plain is not being built, I began to, to, uh, to make films. But he was a, a very, very special uh, filmmaker because he would sign his uh, uh, screenplays just like uh, Johann Sebastian Bach signed his uh, um, you know, uh, musical uh, uh, notations with the three initials, S, D, G, soli deo gloria. I mean, can you imagine an architect today doing something like this to sign the plans of the building with these three initials only for the glory of God, soli deo gloria? Well, you know, we had, a, I mentioned a modern, uh, um, yes, I mean, a filmmaker in my opinion, the greatest, although he thought Tarkovsky was the greatest, or whatever, they were both great. But, but Bergman went on uh, to elaborate on his thought about the cathedral. And I, I imagine that, that Ruskin would have applauded him. And not just Ruskin, but also Auguste Rodin. Rodin, the great, great, great French sculptor who wrote the most beautiful book on the cathedrals, the Cathedral of France, Le Cathedral de France. I truly recommend you that book. It was translated into English 
uh, it is a magnificent writing about about the Gothic, about the Gothic cathedral. And in that book, uh, Auguste Rodin says exactly what uh, Ingmar Bergman said. They both said that when art and religion divorced themselves from each other, they both died. Rodin, who was a great artist, said it, and Bergman, who was a great artist, said it. Uh, Bergman, uh, Bergman said the artists, the modern artists, are like little ants uh, transporting the dead skin of the dead snake. And because of the, because there are so many, the little insects, the little ants, the artists, because of their movement, uh, the carcass, the skin of the dead snake appears to be alive, but is actually dead. And, and Rodin, well, he didn't have this metaphor with a snake, but he also said very plainly in La Cathedrale de France, when art and religion cut their ties, they both died. Uh, yes, there, there was, there are moments of, of, of greatness, uh, in, in, in art, even uh, done by the, the, the individual little ant. But all in all, I think uh, both uh, uh, Bergman and Rodin were correct. And Bergman went on to say that uh, he was very moved by the fact that the Chart Chartres Cathedral, which, which may, be, may be one of, one or even the most, the greatest uh, Gothic uh, cathedral, uh, in, in, in many ways, it, it, it is, and uh, in, it is one of the best, but may, some think it is the best cathedral ever built. And it was rebuilt in 25 years by a little village with 25,000 people, because it burned down in, in the 11th century or early 12th, and then it was rebuilt by a small village in just 25 years why they had faith. That's why St. John the Divine Cathedral in New York is still unfinished. Of course, any cathedral is, is all cathedrals are at least in part unfinished, but St. John the Divine Cathedral having all the money in the world, all the technology in the world uh, is, is unable to arrive at a certain level of completion. And I would say it's because of lack of faith. You know, it has millions of people and uh, incredible resources, but they do not have what the little village called Chartres in, uh, in the medieval France had. Now, coming back to John Ruskin, I think John Ruskin would have been good friends with Auguste Rodin and with uh, Ingmar Bergman, because I think Ruskin, although he had his obvious sympathy for the Middle Ages, he was still a modern man. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, not everything about modernity is bad because when you are creative, you have to assume that other half of art that, uh, Char that Charles Baudelaire uh, mentioned. And I'm absolutely sure uh, Raskin would have agreed with, uh, with, uh, with Baudelaire. But he drew, he drew beautifully. Uh, some of his drawings became engravings. Uh, you know, we see nature. No, that's what we see. We see mountains. He, he revered mountains. Uh, he revered, uh, you know, uh, rocks. He, yeah, I, 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 I believe uh, Ruskin was some kind of uh, offspring of, uh, at least to an extent, of Epimetheus. Although, but I don't want to be misunderstood. The Greeks needed both brothers. Just to, 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 to underline exclusive, to make the mistake of ignoring Prometheus, that would not be quite good either. But, but Epimetheus also needs to be considered. And uh, some kind of a balance. Here I remember something, and I know, I know, I, sometimes I repeat myself. Uh, but as Frank Lloyd Wright said, he, he said, yes, I repeat myself, but I repeat myself. Uh, although in my case, I, I was just uh, on the point of, 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 uh, um, of mentioning a beautiful, an interesting, beautiful, I, I can decide now, I would say a beautiful thought of Paul Clare. 
one of those people on the on the roof of Dessau at the Bauhaus who didn't take his hat off. Otherwise, a great, great poet of, uh, of, of painting. So Paul Klee said that there are two mountains, you know, the beloved mountains of John Ruskin. He said, there is the mountain of the gods, they who know, they know, and the mountain of the animals, they who do not know, they do not know. And in between the two mountains, there is the crepuscular valley of man. They who know, they do not know. So we are in between the, the, the mountain of the animals and the mountain of the gods and our crepuscular valley. Some of us, like Socrates, knows that he doesn't know. But unfortunately, the world is run by those people who do not know they do not know. Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, so those are very dangerous, and unfortunately, they have power most of the time. Uh, I mean, look, look, an art critic who took his pencils uh, and uh, and uh, drew a leaf. You know, who cares today about a leaf? But I think we should care because the whole uh, creation is right there in a leaf. And, uh, and uh, it's for all to see, but we still don't see it. It's, it's very beautiful to notice that actually between, uh, even, yes, okay, he didn't take his head off in, uh, at uh, La Tourette or uh, Ronchon, but Le Corbusier was a man of, uh, of an equal uh, passion for, uh, for nature. And he, just like Frank Lloyd Wright, they both advocated in very, very clear terms, uh, studying nature, learning from nature. And as Frank Lloyd Wright said, it will never let you down. I'm sure also John Ruskin thought in the same way. But he's, on the other hand, a poet here in Romania said, uh, a great poet cannot be born in a, in a city. He, he, is to, he has to be born in a village. In other words, close to nature. I don't know if he was right, but in a certain sense he was, that you, if you are born in nature or in a village, your chance of being uh, uh, closer to nature is higher and, uh, and you can learn a lot from, uh, from nature. But Ruskin also learned a lot from, uh, from an architecture that belonged to uh, another century um, he, he loved us. He loved Venice. Now you would say, who doesn't love Venice? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, modern tourism uh, probably is a great enemy of Venice, and maybe without probably. I remember what uh, um, actually a Romanian poet who lives in the United States said. He's a poet, and he published many books. Uh, Andrei Codrescu. He said that uh, tourists are uh, terrorists with cameras and the terrorists are uh, tourists with, uh, uh, no, uh, tourists are terrorists with, with uh, cameras and uh, uh, the terrorists are tourists with guns. Uh, there is something alarming about uh, tourists and uh, maybe that's why every time I went to Venice after two or three days, uh, I, I, I was extremely tired. It's just too much tourism, uh, not with a pandemic. Now in the 19th century, of course, tourism was not as developed. So Raskin was, uh, uh, his uh, perceptions of, of Venice uh, were very different. But on the other hand, talking about a modern, modern uh, poet like Marinetti, Marinetti wrote a violent uh, uh, poem against Venice. He wanted Venice to uh, assume the present and to stop living, you know, nostalgically and uh, parasitically because of uh, tourism and so on. He wanted Venice to be again a force, an urban force and not just milk uh, you know, the, from the splendors of its past. So you see, you have various people. You have uh, Raskin, uh, you have Marinetti. Uh, I think Marinetti loved Venice, but it was a, a love that uh, became negative because he was irritated that uh, Venice uh, uh, indulged too much in, uh, in, 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 in passivity, actually. Uh, 
Well, Venice, of course, is, is, is saved partially because of the glamour of its biennials. In a way, it was a trick. Now these biennials, art biennial, film biennial, architecture biennial, they have these great events that are temporary actually, and, and they give the illusion to Venice that it's still an active city. But it, it is active, but not in that sense, which I think uh, Marinetti was uh, pointing at. Uh, nobody denies the splendors of the past of, uh, of Venice, but uh, in what way can we, for example, I could jump now to a presentation about uh, a French architect who lives in Brooklyn, uh, New York, uh, uh, Mark Forn, and his, interestingly, his uh, architecture firm is called uh, uh, The Very Many. So the very many that the Gothic times uh, um, also, uh, not that they advocated, but the Gothic times, uh, the, you know, the great buildings of, of the Gothic times were also built by the very many. So in a way, the, the name of the, of, the, of the company of Mark Form who works with uh, parametrics and uh, with uh, scripting and programming, there is something I would say, maybe not consciously uh, chosen by him, uh, something so-called uh, Gothic in, in this attempt to bring the very many uh, into what he does. Um, there are there are many things, many many possible readings of, of, of the thoughts and drawings of, of someone like John Ruskin. He 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 wanted again a society that has different values that aspires towards something that uh, in the Middle Ages was very uh, very obvious. I mean, at that time in in Europe there was faith. People were not playing games with uh, erecting a cathedral. No, for them, it was the a modus vivendi. People lived in the shadow of the cathedral and they died in the shadow of the cathedral. And most often they died before the cathedral even arrived at a certain uh, level of completion. You know, I, I wonder what kind of people were they, you know, is it they, they didn't live for themselves. Although, I know human nature is human nature. Even at that time, probably, uh, you know, th there were things that were far from being uh, perfect. But but I I know what the French cathedrals are because I lived for a short for a while in France, and I have been to Beauvais, Rheims, Rouen, Amiens, uh, uh, Chartres, and so on, uh, and and. Again, I suggest to you to read, if you want, Le Cathedral de France by Auguste Rodin. But he already felt more than 100 years ago the disaster that will follow. He already anticipated, um, you know, uh, the, the, the increasing uh, desacralization of life and art. And uh, it happened perhaps more quickly and more dramatically than. Uh, what he uh, expected. Back to the drawings by John Ruskin. Uh, could we say that John Ruskin was a man with his uh, eyes uh, and his heart oriented exclusively, exclusively towards the past? I don't think so. No, he was active. He was a, he was belong he belonged to his time, but he belonged to his time. Uh, 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 trying to learn from a time which was very different from his. Uh, and um, again, we see a lot of nature, you know, in this case, an apple. In this case, uh, you know, uh, this is a very lyrical uh, uh, artwork by him. I, 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 it's almost a little bit difficult to decipher what I see. Uh, it's one of his most poetical um, uh, drawings uh, or watercolors, whatever it is. Uh, you know, looking at this artwork, uh, I realized he had a very, very, very sensitive uh, uh, soul. I mean, I, I can feel that this is a this is an artwork of, of someone who maybe was very similar in a way to Chopin. 
you know, in visual terms, I mean, graphically speaking. Uh, some other drawings uh, are um, a little more descriptive, uh, more uh, curative, especially when he draws uh, uh, architecture, but here is not architecture. Uh, nevertheless, it is clear that John Ruskin loved, loved, loved nature. He also loved, uh, <laughs> as you can see, the uh, urbe. He loved the city, but uh, not the modern city. And the cathedral is for all to see dominating the, uh, the town. I once was on Fifth Avenue in New York uh, around 22nd, 23rd Street, and I on Fifth Avenue, yes, and I turned my back. Uh, my my head, and I saw a little church was right in the axis of the Empire State Building, which was I don't know uh, eight streets uh, behind or so, and the and the church was like uh, the eighth part of the height, maybe even less of the height of the Empire State Building. Uh, it's too bad I didn't have a camera with me, but I, I for a second I thought about it you know we we reversed we reversed the the, the known hierarchy a man became much taller than god uh, and uh, i'm not saying that dimensions physical dimensions are uh, um, you know uh, fatally uh, those that uh, uh, crystallize a meaning but still it does say something you know in the middle ages the the building in the center and the tallest was the church, was the cathedral, was God, the house of God, not any longer. And by far, men, uh, you know, succeeded in replacing God with himself. And we just mimic here and there the pale gestures of uh, faith. Now, now it is gone. We don't have it any longer. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the same kind of abuse that we show towards nature, we also show towards God. Uh, yeah, we still build a few churches here and there. I mean, I mentioned Le Corbusier, but Le Corbusier was more almost an atheist. He didn't want to build Ronchamp. He didn't want to receive that commission. It, it was the, an exceptional monk, Couturier, uh, who was a friend of the modern artists, and, and he persuaded Le Corbusier to build Ronchamp. And I'm glad uh, Le Corbusier accepted uh, the commission, but initially he didn't want to. And uh, uh, yeah, he built some interesting buildings uh, like the Saint-Pierre de firmin and La Tourette as well, uh, and even a house of shadows of Chandigarh. But uh, I, I, I always ask myself, what about Le Corbusier's faith? And I don't think he had. He was rather eclectic, so to speak, in the field of uh, uh, faith, if, if, if I can say something like this. The only, uh, um, you know, uh, not proof, but the only, uh, you know, the only image I, I saw relating to the faith of Le Corbusier was, I have seen once a, a picture in, in, in one of his bedrooms in a bedroom, and he had above his uh, the, the the above his head on the wall above above the bed uh, the, the headboard of, of his bed a painting a religious painting, but it was religious in a very strange way. It was eclectic. It was some kind of a melange, a mixture of various uh, images relating to various religions. Anyway. Uh, back to back to uh, Ruskin. I don't think uh, Ruskin had a, an eclectic uh, faith at all, uh, and uh, I, I, I do believe his faith was uh, much more uh, firm than uh, uh, you know uh, Le Corbusier's. Uh, this I'm sure. Would you want a couple of words about Ruskin's relationship to his contemporaries? Please, sure. All right. There are two dominant ideologies in Victorian England. Progress, according to which the Middle Ages was this crude, backward, barbaric time, and capitalism. And there is among writers and artists a revulsion against 
naked capitalism. Don't forget there were no unions. You know, if you were working for a factory and the factory owner decided they didn't need the workers, they could throw you out on the street with no severance, pay nothing. And there were big economic crises in the first half of the 19th century where it looked like there might be a revolutionary uprising. And there were three reform bills, the last of which was passed in the 1860s to make conditions less oppressive and that saved them from a revolution. So Engels who worked with Marx is in England. Marx spent time in England and did a lot of his writing there. Ruskin and Carlyle, who was the conservative champion of the Middle Ages, all were repulsed by this, as was Charles Dickens, his novel Hard Times attests to that. So this produced in some people a radical response and in some a reactionary response. Carlyle uh, emphasized the inequality of rank in the Middle Ages and bought into a kind of idealized theory that the peasant and the, you know, the, the serf were happy in their lot because the beneficent Lord took care of them, whereas the factory owner didn't give a damn what happened to his workers. Engels went the other way, but they both talked about the alienation of the worker from the labor and about how that had been different before the rise of capitalism and about the estrangement of person from person in the modern city. There's a passage in the working class in England in 1844 where Engels says you pass somebody on the street and you don't even get looked in the eye, how different this is from past ages. So Ruskin is kind of in a funny middle position between Carlyle, who basically wanted a strong authoritarian leader to create order, and Marx, who wanted to overthrow the entire capitalist order. And he's arguing for a more egalitarian conception of art and of work where even the stonemason has something independent to contribute. You aren't all just carrying out orders from somebody at the top. This organic sense of community is what he finds in the Middle Ages and lacking in his own time. So that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch from years of graduate study of Victorian England of what was going on in Ruskin's lifetime. Thanks for indulging it. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I, I think uh, what you mentioned is, 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 is very important. Uh, I was thinking also about uh, uh, somehow maybe appears a little bit unrelated, Otto Wagner in, 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 uh, in Vienna, in Austria, mm. in, initially in the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was, to an extent, uh, maybe a good extent, a, a modern architect. He brought, he helped uh, modernism arrive in uh, what used to be the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but he also for a number of years, and not a little number of years, he uh, was very active uh, in, in an empire and even serving the, the, the emperor. So uh, when you have this uh, duality, on one hand, uh, you aspire towards a certain level of democracy, of, you know, equality, but on the other hand, you also uh, uh, look with a certain level of sympathy towards, uh, you know, a, a, an emperor. So you, you belong to two modes of, uh, of um, uh, you know, uh, two systems in a way. And maybe uh, what you tried, to, you, you said uh, also refers to something like this after all. Uh, Great Britain uh, in the second half of the 20th century, of the 19th century, was ruled by Queen Victoria. And uh, so there was an empress there. Uh, and uh, yes, she was a woman. She was not a man, but an empress. And, uh, you know, this, this the duality, on one hand, egalitarian uh, dreams, and on the other hand, uh, maybe also sympathizing with some of the you know, because to have a center, uh, uh, a center, even a spiritual center, uh, 
a social a political center is not necessarily bad. I mean, I was thinking even about our present. Now we 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 have in in a good part of the world we have the so-called democracies, but we also strangely sympathize a lot with uh, Prince Charles and then uh, until she lived with Princess Diana. We we seem to have a fascination with uh, with uh, an aristocracy that is you know in good measure the, the very opposite of uh, our democratic societies if we are so democratic why are why are we so interested in a prince and a princess you know uh, so maybe in our in our hearts and in our minds and in our mythology the the prince and the princess the king and the queen still somehow exist and uh, if we could somehow marry the advantages, the positive aspects of democracy, and also, uh, it's not easy. I, I don't know exactly how to do this, to, to, to marry. Maybe, I don't know, Denmark can do it. You know, there are some countries where they have, uh, you know, a queen and a king, and, uh, and they're also very democratic and very civilized and so on. I don't know, but in essence, I think from what uh, Paul said, it is about the eternal struggle between multiplicity and unity. You know, to have to have both, to have uh, you know the so-called humble worker who is uh, not living in an undignified way, but but quite the opposite, and at the same time to have uh, you know uh, some kind of. Uh, uh, you know, a political elite, but an elite which is enlightened and not uh, arrogant and not, uh, uh, you know, uh, not deserving to be where it is. But I think artists in general in the field of politics are not very <laughs> astute. I mean, it's known that, uh, I mean, you know, there are even uh, tragic. Uh, situations, you know, like uh, where you had Heidegger sympathize with, uh, with Hitler or um, uh, Knut Hamsun, the great uh, Norwegian writer or uh, Emil Nol, the uh, truly great uh, uh, painter. So, you know, how to explain this very sensitive and intelligent uh, artist being unable to, to decipher behind the you know, the, the, the glittering uh, splendor of uh, the Führer. Or, you know, it's, it shows clearly that the artists are uh, children, uh, uh, some naive children sometimes. Uh, yes, please, please, Jan. Jean, uh, I don't know how you pronounce your name, please. Please uh, say what you want to say. If you can, if you have an active microphone. It looks like she left the meeting. Uh, okay, uh, so, um, um, so um, uh, what, was I, what was I trying to say is that, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, e even Raskin, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how he was, how, how he was able to marry his idealism with the, with, the, with the realities of his time. And he was an aristocrat. I'm sure he was like, uh, um, he was an aristocrat who probably uh, saluted the uh, proletarian in a very uh, uh, sincere okay. and considerate way. Uh, but he was an aristocrat and um, so, I don't know. It, it, it's it, it's complicated. Uh, human affairs are complicated uh, with the best intentions. I still see this sign of Ginny or Jean uh, Jean Breslin uh, raising her ha hand. Um, I don't know why this is showing up. I see but, she's there, and I don't see an image. She hasn't turned video on, but but is I... the microphone active? Because it seems she wants to say something. And of course, she's welcome to. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, even his beloved Venice, 
you know, he loved Venice, but uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, inequality and there were a lot of problems in Venice as well. And uh, from what I read, Venice was not a, a pure land, you know, it was uh, itself a human society with its problems, uh, with its uh, unfairness, with its uh, corruption even. Uh, a very rich city, of course, but th those riches were obtained in various ways, you know, militarily as well. So, you know, it's hard to obtain paradise on earth. It's very easy to find refuge in the past and, uh, you know, imagine that everything was beautiful, you know, when the Chartres Cathedral was, was built. I'm sure there were many problems, you know, and uh, yes, the cathedral is splendid, but uh, who knows what happened in its shadow. I'm not trying to, you know, to uh, cut down uh, an invitation to exuberance. Um, anyway, uh, we keep going, uh, keep looking at some of his drawings. Uh, this drawing I like more than uh, some others. Uh, but what is very, very uh, moving here is that he drew so much. And, uh, and um, you know, I, I remember what, uh, what Goethe said, that unless you draw something, you cannot truly claim that you saw that something. Uh, so maybe Goethe knew what he was talking about. You can only see something when you draw that something with your own hand. I, I don't know if taking pictures uh, is, is the same thing. Probably not. Uh, no, I, I agree. It's a drawing. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yay, I unmuted it. I wanted to mention Corbusier's work, workers' housing in Pesach, 1923. Very, um, very abstract very rigidly designed, but they were altered by the workers themselves later on. Yeah. Roofs were, pitched roofs were added, um, shutters, very strange things and interesting. And there's an example, I think, of a village overcoming A very uh, a very mindful architect. You said the uh, village overcoming. I did understand correctly. Overcome like a headstrong architect. Not a headstrong architect, but a a very theoretical architect. Ah, yeah. Okay, that's a great. A great relevant observation, I think. Well, this is almost un uh, unavoidable when uh, you know the we we you know the, the poet, the artist uh, idealize uh, uh, even the you know what might be described as as the margins of, of society, but the the margins of society are not uh, very educated in the field of uh, you know in this case, modern architecture. So they still have the longings towards forms of, uh, you know, living and uh, expressing that living architecturally that is not, uh, uh, you know, the most uh, advanced. Uh, it's, it's well, it, it's, it's much discussed in architecture schools um, and much uh, admired in a way. You mean the, the interventions of the- of the, the interventions of the residents. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, maybe you, you remember, you know that Le Corbusier used to say that in the end, life is always right. So it's possible that Le Corbusier in the end would have uh, accepted and maybe even admired the, the modifications because he also said Brizel as a call Même le col le Corbusier, break the schools, even the school le Corbusier. So I, I like to imagine, I like to imagine, maybe I'm just imagining, but I like to imagine that he would have uh, uh, bowed his head in front of the, these interventions. 
And no, he felt violated by it. Ah, really? <laughs> <laughs> then I, I, I was wrong. Although I have to say, in his book, A Journey to the East, uh, he was 22 years old when he, he traveled through certain uh, Eastern European countries. And at one point, he made a statement, and I have the quotation uh, somewhere in my, uh, in my uh, archive. Uh, it says something like this. He, he, he seemed to be outraged. Uh, the abuses that uh, um, the quest for the new uh, was uh, was bringing to uh, the vernacular culture. He seemed to admire the vernacular culture. I'm talking about Le Corbusier. He was not yet Le Corbusier as we know him. He was 22 years old. But he did write in that book, and it's really astonishing because we are talking about him, about Le Corbusier. He, he took sides with the vernacular culture. He said it, but he didn't do it. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Although he did do it with Le Cabanon, his, his own home uh, at the edge of uh, the Mediterranean Sea that became so... In fact, I, I wrote to Kenneth Frampton, I said, for me, Le Cabanon, which is only 16 meters, meters square, uh, is more important than Villa Savoie. And, and I was honest when I said this. So yes, it's true, Le Corbusier is seen by some, at least by some as a monster, especially in the field of urbanism. And it's true, uh, there were problems with his buildings uh, and his thoughts sometimes. But uh, I think he was a complex man. Again, the same man built Le Cabanon, which is uh, almost a manifesto for sustainability, ecology, and so on. He built it. How, how many architects today would live in a 16 square meters house uh, that looks like uh, it's for a Robinson Crusoe or something, you know? Uh, he, he designed, if you see his office, it's right near Le Cabanon. It's a little hut, two meters by three meters with a vertical window, a truly traditional window with a small squares of glass. And that's where he drew the plans for Chandigarh. All alone, can you imagine an architect today working in a room two meters by three meters? I don't. He did. And there are pictures with him there. It's true, uh, splendid environment around him, the Mediterranean Sea at the bottom and trees around. But it was two meters by three meters. Anyway. Yes. Uh, I, I have a footnote, which is amusing. Please. The workers' housing in Pesach, once Corbusier's ideas and theories became part of the culture, were purchased, of course, by um, wealthy people. All the workers' changes were removed, and now they're the pristine version of what he originally designed. Yes, I have seen pictures um, of it and the color uh, in a certain way. They were restored, so to speak. But maybe they should have remained in the hands of those uh, less privileged and uh, less knowing, so to speak. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. For example, Jean Nouvel built a, a building in Amosius uh, uh, where he, it's a very good building, but uh, he uh, invited some of his artist friends to, to do some so-called artworks on the concrete walls of the apartments. And uh, there are some scribbles there, very interesting, but you know nothing truly exceptional. And through contract, the, the owners of, of those uh, apartments couldn't do any change to them. They had to live with them forever. And here is the arrogance of the architect, you know, who imposes uh, his views, uh, I would say, beyond certain limits. And uh, uh, what, what can we say? Yeah, I understand you want the integrity of your work, but uh, I think there are some limits now where you should allow indeed life to assert itself. 
but uh, architects in general are arrogant and controlling. I mean, it's known well, that story with uh, um, Joseph Hoffman, no, who designed even the slippers of the of the owner of the house. And when he visited the, the his former client once, he he noticed that the the client had a different pair of, of slippers, and he got mad. The architect got mad. <laughs> That because uh, because of the different kind of uh, slippers, uh, the former client uh, uh, disturbed the harmony, the the wholeness, the splendor of his creation. <laughs> our life keeps messing up art, doesn't it? Uh, sounds yeah. like uh, sounds like Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, I was who required mention. who required his uh, patrons to wear certain clothing to to blend with his uh, architecture. To match the buildings, yes. In a way, this is a characteristic problem when people who participate in elite culture try to adopt the energies of vernacular culture. They get it wrong. Yes. Like the, the poet Derek Walcott, the Nobel Prize winning poet from the Caribbean, whom I wrote a book about, decided to start using Caribbean Creole speech in his poems. And people criticized him for not quite having it idiomatically correct. I'm standing on the roof of my building. Well, yeah. <laughs> or he once quoted a song by Bob Marley. As, you should explain that. What? Oh, yeah. I'm standing on the roof of my building was a line in the disastrous musical that he did with Paul Simon that bombed. And it's completely unidiomatic. No New Yorker would say, I'm sleeping on the roof of my building. You'd say, I'm sleeping up on the roof. And that was the name of the song. The name of a very popular song and they just botched it. So. The I think I'm migrating away from. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's let this from drop. Dan's original issue that comes up in all kinds of ways. The interplay between elite and vernacular culture is very fraught. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll uh, we'll continue our journey through the graphic works of uh, John Ruskin. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean. In my opinion, there were greater artists than, than John Ruskin. But what is remarkable is that, that, that he also exercised his, uh, his uh, talents um, artistically and not just uh, analytically through his uh, theories and so on. And I, this is probably something uh, uh, more critics should try to do. You know, a critic analyzes some poems, but what about having the critic write some poems and uh, not uh, ridiculously, you know, it, it's difficult. It's like marrying the two sides of your brain and uh, you need different abilities in order to paint and uh, in order to analyze what uh, someone painted. Uh, for example, uh, John Ruskin loved uh, Turner. Turner was a great painter uh, indeed. And I would say very, very modern. Uh, Turner was not uh, uh, a painter that uh, had, in, in my opinion, any kind of connection with medieval uh, iconography. Uh, uh, this shows clearly that Ruskin was a modern man, but uh, uh, he was also a man who uh, didn't ignore the past, a certain past. Um, so he was a complex man. Uh, John Ruskin, and I, I think he deserves to be uh, read, uh, including by me, more carefully, and uh, you know, to, to to talk about him, to about his ideas, because he was not just about that. He was also, you know, very concerned with society, with uh, the mechanisms of society, with politics. Uh, he didn't ignore. He didn't just try to find refuge in uh, idealized versions of uh, what the Middle Ages were. No, he was concerned with the present, with his present and even the future. And um, so uh, an important, I mean, a thinker, uh, an artist, a critic, a social reformer of his caliber uh, cannot be dismissed uh, 
that he was just nostalgically evaluating a certain past. No, he was, he, he was, uh, he wanted to, he lived in the present and he wanted to reform the present, but inspired by certain, uh, um, you know, ideas in a way that uh, belonged uh, to the past as well, not just to the past. A footnote on uh, Ruskin's interest in Turner. Please. If you walk through the Turner collection at the Tate in London, you see that he started out doing things that are a little like what Ruskin was doing, drawing ruins, drawing buildings in Venice and Rome. And then he discovers this style that's kind of like an English version of Impressionism later in his career. So there's that. And there's also the fact that Turner came of very humble origins. You know, he was not uh, a gentleman, exactly. And I think that moved Ruskin in some way with his democratic instincts. Uh, I, I didn't know this. But I, I admire Turner, and uh, not only because someone said that my paintings re resemble a little bit uh, Turner. Uh, one day I will show I'll show everybody some of my paintings. Anyway, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, back to back to Venice and back to Ruskin and back to his love of architecture. I think you would have loved uh, loved or liked uh, Mark Horn. I think it's important also to know what is happening in the present. And um, I don't know if this was done by him. I, I, I saw it, uh, the, you know, associated with his name, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, but this one is indeed by him. He loved rocks and not the smallest, <laughs> as you can see, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge rock. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, are rocks so insensitive as they might appear? Maybe not. Maybe they do have a soul. Maybe someone animistically oriented uh, uh, feels that uh, rocks also uh, might have a certain sensitivity. I don't know. Although sometimes I feel they must be more sensitive than some human beings. Hmm. Well, Christ says of St. Peter, whose name means rock, on this rock I built my church. Maybe Ruskin had that in the back of his head. Maybe. This is one yeah. of his uh, yeah. best artworks, I think. I, I, I always love this uh, watercolor by him. It's both precise and uh, impressionistic. It, 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 it's, it, I have a feeling this is one of his best uh, uh, best artworks from the ones I saw. Uh, he, without doubt, this man loved nature in a deep way. And uh, I think uh, just from this, we could inspire ourselves because I do think that um, uh, nature is uh, immensely important. And uh, what else can I say? Uh, I mean, human society is too, but uh, you know, we come and go, no? But uh, nature is uh, enduring. And uh, uh, that's why I was so surprised and so saddened uh, by the, the commentary of uh, an important architect today, uh, uh, Winnie Mass, uh, who said that we mentioned over, you know, uh, over uh, outsmarting nature. And I, I just felt that. And he's a good architect. And not only that, he grew up in a village. And I, I, I'm sure he, he loves flowers. He worked with flowers. But how could he say something like this outsmarting nature? I don't know. Anyway, um, yes, I mean, here we have the love of nature, and then we have the, the love of architecture. And uh, it's, it's, it's in the 19th century, uh, Many, many architects uh, flirted with, uh, uh, you know, idealized versions of the Middle Ages. Even uh, Schinkel, uh, you know, had romantic visions of uh, castles and cathedrals. And it was in this, in this respect, uh, the 19th century was, uh, I, I think, uh, very, very interesting. 
again, uh, nature in a, almost a disturbed and disturbing way a little bit. The, the destruction that also takes part in nature uh, is, is part of the creativity of nature. Is, uh, we, we, we cannot dismiss it. And then back to the splendors of, uh, of uh, Venice, uh, and not only Venice, uh, in terms of colors, this artwork uh, makes one think a little bit of uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, yeah. just in terms of colors, um, otherwise it doesn't. And again, this is a typical uh, watercolor by, by John Ruskin. He was fascinated by uh, details, architectonic details, uh, and he, he was able to capture the, the essence of the detail in, uh, accurately and uh, succinctly. Uh, we have seen this one. Uh, anyway, there are many. Um, I think he deserves to be read. And uh, now we just had this imp imperfect discussion meandering through some, you know, uh, matters related or less related to, to him because it is his birthday. But uh, uh, this involvement, uh, this intense involvement of the intellectual, artistically, culturally, socially, politically, is very, very important because we don't live just in nature and we don't live just in society. We try to marry between you remember the, that triad, uh, nature, art, society. Well, we are in between, you know, the, uh, in a way, the two mountains that Paul Klee mentioned, you know, nature on one hand, society on the other. And uh, we need somehow to negotiate between the two in, uh, in, in, a, in a certain way, um, between culture and nature, uh, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult because the human being is a, uh, is a fallen creature. No? It was uh, banished from the paradise. So we are now <clears throat> so-called free, uh, but uh, disoriented and uh, disorienting as well. But, but nature is still there. And we cannot just uh, say we'll outsmart nature. No, it doesn't work. It will never work. Uh, so they, only a few foolish human being would say something like this, outsmarting nature. Again, I'm surprised that the, one of the best architects today something, said something like this. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, some, some watercolors are more abstract. They refer to his inner nature, no? I mean, he is clearly in this watercolor a, a modern artist. Um, you know, this is an abstract, uh, it's a view of a cave, I think, but uh, it's abstract, it is. Uh, you don't recognize the cave any longer. Uh, here we see dramatic human scenes, uh, human society. Uh, architecture, dark sky, I'm sure he knew something about the darkness of, of life as well. Um, he was a tumultuous man, you know, uh, with an incredible energy and uh, able to be very focused, but also able to disperse himself, it seems, in, in various domains. Um, yes, uh, a remarkable man. And here we see in this the watercolor uh, um, combined with some drawing, uh, we see, uh, I think, in a way, uh, um, an image of, a, of an urban settlement that, uh, you know, uh, was, uh, he, he aspired towards, you know, this uh, dance, uh, he, he was able to admire nature, but here we see the human society condensed in a, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a place that is not uh, huge. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a medieval kind of uh, town, what we see here. Crowded. Fire is the highest thing in the landscape. Right, right, right. 
Yeah. And uh, the human uh, society of this place is in between the water and the sky. So the two fluidities in a way. Well, considering he was not an architect, uh, it's still remarkable that he, you know, he dedicated time to, to make this uh, rather elaborate uh, uh, watercolors. And then abruptly changed completely, turned to, to landscapes completely devoid of uh, human beings and human life and uh, human society. But all in all, what we saw is uh, an, was an attempt. I mean, is an attempt that he had uh, to 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 consider both nature and society through through his thoughts and also through his art. Um, It's also obvious he longed for the absolute, for the infinite. I'm almost thinking of Brand by Henry Gibson here, you know, these, these uh, cliffs, you know, almost frightening in the, you know, proximity to God and uh, their, their majesty. And they, I, I, I don't know, it's something about this landscape that, uh, uh, you know, you need a certain uh, kind of person to sympathize with them because I don't know if he if he drew what he saw is more like he drew what he he painted what he imagined. A few days ago, it was the uh, the day when uh, I don't know how many one hundred around one hundred thirty years ago. Um, no, no, two hundred. I'm a little bit confused. Was it took no, no, one, about 130 years ago, Henry Gibson uh, published, no, it was performed, uh, The Enemy of the People or An Enemy of the People, a beautiful play about a man who, who tried to save a, a town from being uh, sickened by uh, polluted water. And uh, in the end, the town turns against him and consider him an enemy of the of uh, its enemy, when in fact he wanted to save the town. And this is this is incredible, you know. Here you have a hero, a man with the best intentions, who tried to do good, and and society interprets him uh, as as being uh, an enemy and an adversary and so on. And this happens. You know, this happens all the time, you know, where you have uh, people with, who, are, who are also seers, who see truth and they defend it. And strangely, those who are, you know, to be served by, by, by the dedication of the above, the, the above mentioned uh, person uh, turn against him. It's, I think of Trump vilifying Anthony Fauci. Right. One to save us from the COVID pandemic. Right. Anyway, the Gothic again, the beloved Gothic of, uh, of John Ruskin. And the Gothic is beautiful. I mean, you know, if you are not tired, uh, I, if I was not tired, I would talk incessantly because I have presentations here about the most important cathedrals of France uh, and not only of France. Uh, I, 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 have, uh, I have a lot of material about uh, the Middle Ages because I, I, I love the Middle Ages myself. I mean, look at this drawing. This is unbelievable. I mean, it, we, that is, it's so mysterious and at the same time so precise at the top part and drawn. It's just, uh, I, I, I don't know how he did it actually, especially the, the top part here. Anyway, um, 
and look at his tools, you know. These are the tools uh, of, of, of the artist, of the critic, of the social reformer, of the thinker. Um, they move me, you know, uh, you have the tool, the ruler there, you, you know, to measure things, but then you have the tools of the watercolorist, and then you have the, you know, the notes books. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's something, I mean, on the left, we have the, you know, the, you know, even the disorder of, of, of you know, the, the trying on the colors and so on. And then on the right is this tension between, you know, it's, it's, there is some kind of complicity of a complicity between, uh, you know, the dirt here and the order that art represents, even though it is just sketched and so on, you know, I mean, just compare what is here with what is here. Here is order, is, uh, uh, but the, the darkness became light, uh, disorder became order. And uh, this, this dichotomy and this tension uh, is, is, is always present, really. So um, anyway, that's it. Uh, I mean, I- about what you just said before you go on. Pardon? I thought about what you've just been saying. Another sign of Ruskin's humility, his rejection of the notion of the artist as ego, is that so much of his drawing isn't about, this is a great drawing by John Ruskin. It's about, this is an architectural detail that I find beautiful. And I'm going to serve that other artist by making my drawing. I mean, his, his technical skill as a draftsman is first class, it seems to me. You know, that, that flower picture with the, the thin blue petals that you just showed is, takes incredible skill to do something like that. But it was often in the service of other people's art. That make any sense? Yes, yes, it does. Um, you know, from someone coming from, from art uh, is, uh, you know, maybe, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I have to think a little bit about his, uh, uh, yeah, he did what you said that he, he drew uh, um, and, and in a way he disappeared behind the drawing. His, his, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Ego didn't show up, was not, was not present. Mm -hmm. um, although in some uh, watercolors and drawings, I do see him or I imagine I see him uh, subjectively, yes. Um, anyway, um, I have, I, I don't know, maybe it's too late now. I, I, can, I have, uh, as I said, I can, I can make presentations about Victorian architecture, it's right here. I have one about Philip Webb, uh, you know, the father in a way of arts, the arts and crafts movement. Then I have one about Sir George Gilbert Scott, both all, I mean, all three presentations are, are about the 19th century, but already two hours passed since we started. And maybe it was not the most, uh, you know, spectacular, so to speak, uh, celebration of John Ruskin. But I think the important thing is that we remember him and that, uh, you know, it's up to us if we continue to investigate who he was, to read some of his texts. And, uh, and uh, we can only learn, uh, that's for sure. Uh, Thank you. It's a great talk. It really was. Uh, you know, it, it may have wandered a bit, but it wandered to really interesting places. So thank you. I have to go, but thanks. Well, I, I, I thank you very much.